Sakura Wars GB, the Game Boy Color spin-off of Sega's Sakura Wars series, developed by Jupiter and published by Media Factory, was an extremely ambitious game, with its highly detailed graphics, abundance of voice acting, and variety of gameplay modes and features. What might be its most ambitious feature, though, is actually totally inaccessible, and even hacking the game would only give you half the intended experience. You see, there were originally plans to have Sakura Wars GB connect to the Dreamcast port of Sakura Wars 1. Doing so would have let you unlock exclusive bonus features in GB, as well as make other unlockable features in the game easier to access than via their normally intended methods. Flashback to issue 531 of Weekly Famitsu Magazine, which featured an interview with Tetsukayama, chief director of a company known as Marigold Management. Marigold Management was a joint venture between Nintendo Company Limited and a human resources firm known as Recruit Holdings Company Limited, made primarily to foster development for the N64. At the time, Recruit owned Media Factory, Sakura Wars GB's eventual publisher, with Kayama also serving as its president. In this interview, the existence of Sakura Wars GB was very casually revealed, although the details were extremely scant, basically boiling down to 1. It's happening, and 2. They were aiming to have it released by the end of 1999, a target they didn't quite make. The dearth of any concrete details didn't stop the news from making waves, though, forcing Sega's then-president and Sakura Wars executive producer, Shoichiro Irimajiri, to put out a public statement on the matter via Sega's official website, saying, quote, The contents of the Weekly Famitsu article were a unilateral announcement from Mr. Kayama. While it is true that we received a proposal from Mr. Kayama to publish Sakura Wars on the Game Boy Color, we at Sega have one condition for this proposal. That condition is to have the Game Boy Color and the Dreamcast connect to each other. For Mr. Kayama to have announced the Game Boy Color version of Sakura Wars must mean that he has a clear idea of how to fulfill this condition, though we at Sega have yet to receive any concrete details regarding this. If this is true, then we are very much looking forward to it. Marigold released their own follow-up statement shortly thereafter. Following talks between Tetsu Kayama, chief director at Marigold Management, and Shuichiro Irimajiri, CEO of Sega Entertainment, we can confirm an understanding has been reached with regards to the development and publishing of the Game Boy Color version of Sakura Wars. At the same time, we can acknowledge that the two parties have reached a mutual agreement about the connectivity between the Game Boy Color version of Sakura Wars and the Dreamcast version of Sakura Wars 3. For more information, please reach out directly to either Tetsukayama or Nintendo Company Limited CEO Hiroshi Yamauchi. These frankly bizarre statements are the only official public-facing confirmation that the game was originally meant to feature Dreamcast connectivity at some point in time. Not only that, but it was initially envisioned for Sakura Wars 3, and not the Dreamcast port of 1 like it turned out in the end. Now, you might imagine this connectivity would have been achieved with something like, say, a cable, much like how the Neo Geo Pocket could link with a Dreamcast for various games using the Dreamcast Link cable. Alas, no. The truth is actually far weirder. Tetsukayama and Marigol Management were no strangers to pioneering bizarre video game peripherals. Some of them were actually ahead of their time, like the 64GB cable, which would have connected the Game Boy Color to the Nintendo 64 as a second screen experience, basically a precursor to the Game Boy Advance to GameCube link cable. The games that were at one point confirmed to use it were Derby Stallion 64 and DT Lords of Genomes, both of which were also Media Factory games. This peripheral was eventually cancelled. But perhaps their most famous, or dare I say infamous, experiment was Hey You Pikachu and its voice recognition unit, developed by Umbrella, one of the many developers supported by Marigold Management, with Kayama himself serving as a manager on the project. With this peculiar pedigree of puzzling peripherals, it's no wonder they concocted a similar scheme for Sakura Wars GB. If you were to play the Dreamcast version of Sakura Wars 1, beginning to end, then enter the One Long Day in the Imperial Theater mode and visit the room of any character whose ending you got, you would see this funny little TV icon with a rapidly cycling series of patterns. You would also see a similar icon when completing a minigame in One Long Day mode, only with the frame colored blue this time. For decades, nobody knew what these icons were even for. The game's manual only says, In One Long Day mode, you may occasionally find a TV mark. Remember where these marks appear, 
something good may happen. Well, as it turns out, these TV marks are the game's method of communicating with the Game Boy Color. This was rumored for a long time, but was officially disclosed in an interview in Sakura Wars Serenade, a Sakura Wars tribute book from 2021. In it, Naoki Hori, the CEO of M2, the developer who oversaw the Dreamcast port, revealed he didn't even know what these barcodes were specifically for, and assumed they would be used in conjunction with a camera of some kind. Series producer Noriyoshi Oba, who served as chief producer on the Dreamcast version, backed up the claims that the Link Function's development was strangely one-sided, saying that while his memory of the development isn't clear, he recalls that the only thing they did was display the barcodes in the game, and that the developers on GB would simply make do with it. He ended by saying that, whatever the reason for the feature's eventual cancellation was, it was probably due to Nintendo themselves. At any rate, no matter what you try, you won't be able to do anything with these barcodes, because the peripheral that enabled this cross-system communication never actually made it to market. It was never formally announced or advertised, it was as though it never even existed in the first place. The only trace of this peripheral's existence in either game is a sporadically appearing option in GB's Kinematron menu. Seriously, it's not listed or pictured in the manual as an available option, and it only ever shows up on one of my Game Boy Colors, but not the other. Spooky stuff. Trying to access this option, when available, will show a diagram detailing how this peripheral was supposed to work. You'd plug it into the Game Boy Color's link cable port, hold it perpendicular to your TV, and scan the flashing barcodes in the TV mark in the Dreamcast game to unlock bonus rewards. Okay, that's already kind of weird, but somehow, it gets even weirder. According to the GB Fan Translations programmer, Dan Gia, the game never actually checks the link cable port for data reading. Instead, when attempting to access this feature, the game checks the Game Boy Color's IR port. This would mean that, based on this information, the TV adapter would have converted the flashing barcodes into an IR signal, and beam it into the IR port to transfer the data. It's worth mentioning that the TV adapter option only appears on Game Boy Color, which has the IR port, and only appears in emulators that implement IR port functionality in a very specific way. That being said, I did manage to track down the original patent for this adapter, filed in March of 2000 by both Media Factory and Jupiter, with Tetsukayama himself listed as the inventor. The detailed description of the patent, specifically sections 16 and 17, mentions that the data from the adapter is sent via the port the device is connected to, which would be the link cable port. Neither section makes any mention of infrared either. As such, I believe the IR port check found in the code may be either due to a programming error or simply a temporary measure from back when the peripheral was still in development and it just never got fixed once it was scrapped outright. Considering how sporadically it appears on real hardware, this may even have been a quick and dirty fix to hide the feature and pretend it never even existed. Fascinatingly enough, according to the same patent, this device wasn't just meant to unlock pre-existing data on a supported game cartridge and transfer simple information such as high scores, like it was meant to in Sakura Wars GB. The device was supposedly also capable of transferring complex game data, for example, stages, characters, and version updates from a variety of sources such as TV broadcasts, arcade cabinets, and yes, other game hardware. The patent specifically mentions that this would prevent users from having to buy new versions of a game and instead be able to update or expand the software they already owned. That's right. This peripheral would have enabled patching and DLC on the Game Boy Color. Though, obviously, only for the games that would have supported it. The exact reasons why the adapter never made it to market are unclear. All we really have to go off of is Noriyoshi Oba's supposition that Nintendo themselves had a hand in its cancellation. Nobody can say for sure without a first-hand source. It's a shame, too, because otherwise, the feature appears to be fully implemented, at least as far as we can tell from the resources we're working with. The feature in-game was referred to as the Dream Collaboration. Whenever you'd scan a barcode from the Dreamcast, the associated character would appear in GB to deliver a message, and then you'd receive an unlock of some kind. 
At present, there's no way to know whose endings would unlock what, or what exactly the minigames would have gotten you, but we do know what the rewards are. Some of the rewards are the same as what you could unlock via other means, like the in-game shop or linking to a pocket Sakura. These include harder difficulties for the GB minigames, the Sakura pedal map icon, and all the stat-boosting equipment. However, there are numerous unique rewards, unobtainable by any other means, and this is where things get interesting. First are the bromides for Orihime and Reni. In the main game, Orihime and Reni make brief cameos during Sakura and Iris's routes respectively, but are otherwise totally absent from the game, since GB takes place before they were formally introduced into the series. They're not even supposed to be here. However, the presence of these secret bromides, along with the fact that they both have unused flags in the game's code for trust levels, suggests they may have had a greater presence at some point. Next is the Portrait Gallery feature. This lets you view every dialogue portrait and background in the game, allowing you to make various custom scenes. However, we also see a ton of backgrounds you never get to see anywhere else. Many of them are recreations of specific moments from Sakura Wars 1, such as the destroyed locker room. This, along with the presence of 8-bit remixes of songs from the first game that are present in the sound test and nowhere else, lends credence to early rumors and assumptions that the game was originally meant to be a straightforward port or adaptation of the first game, rather than a spin-off that just takes place during it. Aside from those two highlights, the rest is fairly standard, if not outrageously generous, such as 90% off discounts for items in the in-game shop, and ludicrous amounts of points to spend in said shop. For more information on all this cut content and more, you can check out the page we on the translation team compiled for the game on the cutting room floor. All this content is there in the game, sealed away in the cartridge, but there's no legitimate way to access any of it. At least, not in the original release version. The English fan translation patch does implement alternate methods of unlocking most of it, so finally, after remaining buried for over 20 years, fans can finally see this content for themselves. It may be minor in the grand scheme of things, but it's exciting to know that, even decades later, people are still discovering new things in these games.